Welcome back to the show, Ellen Bader. Thanks. Glad to be here. Yeah. And this is, we, we have to clarify for the listener, this is the other Ellen Bader. My wife is Ellen Bader also. So <laughs> yeah, I was pretty amazed when I met her. <laughs> I know that was so cool. The two Ellen Baders. Um, well, welcome back. And uh, I'm excited to dive into the topic of differentiation with you. That's, um, man, I, I'm just so fascinated with that subject, particularly as it pertains to couples and how couples do that process. So um, before we do that, uh, I'd love to just remind the listener a little bit about you. How would you describe yourself today? Uh, what are you up to in the world? Oh, well, wow. I'm up to a lot of things. Um, I obviously am working with couples and I train lots of therapists all over the world. I've been especially busy since COVID because of running a number of support groups for therapists, initially helping therapists get up online. And um, I'm also very involved in a project in Kenya, which is building schools in refugee communities mm. and building a counseling program. We're now in 14 schools in different refugee areas wow. from the post-election violence. So it's been intense in Kenya since COVID and mm -hmm. very consuming. And we're trying to figure out different ways to provide support to these kids who really, really have a horrendous time oh, creating wow. lives for themselves. So, yeah. Thanks for doing that work. Wow. And how, just if we rewind the tapes, you're, you're married to Pete, who's been on the podcast before also, how long have you guys been married? So we got married in 1982. So it's a long time. All right. Nice work. Uh, um, did you guys ever have any close calls? Like, I don't know if we're going to make it. Um, sure. I think, I think every couple does. Mm -hmm. And um, there, there are probably two main times that I think of where things got really tough. And one of them actually had to do over the workshops, the five day workshops that we were running for couples. And we hit a point <laughs> where we really, really, really disagreed about how to run them, where yeah. to run them and how to run them. And to the point that neither of us could stand what came out of the other person's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> and it took us a year to resolve it, actually. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that can get real. I mean, Ellen and I, my wife, have um, we're training couples coaches right now to work virtually and um, to collaborate in that process. Collaboration is always harder, right? Than just doing it myself. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But we, we hit some snags for sure. And then just to go back further, I, I can't remember if I've asked you this, but I'm curious, why did you become a therapist? Like, and how, how old were you when you knew you wanted to be a therapist? Um, that's a really great question because I started out planning to go into political science and politics. And I even went to college initially in Washington, DC, and that's the direction I was headed on. But I, I hated the school I was at and I decided to transfer and in the process. So then I transferred to Michigan state and the, so the first year I was there was my sophomore year and I had a psych 101 class mm -hmm. and the professor asked for a volunteer to do hypnosis and I volunteered <laughs> wow. and I was on stage and he did I don't even know what he did, but he did a post-hypnotic suggestion. And what happened was when when the when it get, when it came close to the time ending of the class, I actually found myself walking up on stage and he goes, "What are you doing here?" And I said, "Well, but it's time for the class to end." And I he had planted a suggestion that I would dismiss the class. And the whole thing was so weird to me that it got me much more interested wow. in psychology. Um, but still, I went back and forth for years. And I think I still go back and forth. I mean, I think I've always been involved in some kind of political work and mm -hmm. being a therapist. And I think both of those parts are equally pretty strong in me. Yeah, that's cool. So you're not meaning you have multiple interests here. You're not just a therapist straight up. That's all you do. You have, you've always held on to this political science interest. Right. And I always, and I think always try to look at the system with, with within which somebody lives and was raised and has challenges, not only 
the intrapsychic or brain uh, chemistry of somebody, but also really understanding the impact of yeah. the system they're in. Yeah, cool. Um, I was, uh, I never took a psych course in college because I was too checked out. Um, but I always love hearing people like having a cool experience in like a psych 101 class or something. Well, when you look at what's going on in the world right now, I'm just curious to get your take, uh, because you have so much experience working with couples in particular and, and then the political slant and interest, uh, have we ever been this divided? Not that I can truly remember, mm -hmm. although I was very involved in the uh, movement against the war in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. And at the time, it certainly felt like the country was severely divided then in terms yeah. of those who were for the war and those who were against it. And But it feels more intense now. Yeah. Why do you think that is? What what's I imagine COVID is a, is a factor, but what else is going on that makes this particular time more intense? Do you think? I mean, I think I think it's a complex question because we have social media now, and we have the news media operating very differently than it has any time in the past. Right, and so those elements are fueling the division. Yeah. And making that that so accessible to anybody. And there's, you know, half the time people don't know what they're hearing is true or false. And um, it's just been exacerbated by the way that those two, the, the, the actual media, news media itself and the social media are playing into it. Yeah. And what do you see the impact is on families and couples uh, from your experience working with so many therapists and clients? I mean, you know, I I would say that in the last since COVID started, therapists have been confronted with kinds of problems that they were never confronted with before. Mm -hmm. I mean, and the biggest one, and I've had a couple of cases like this, and I know other therapists do, do too, at the beginning of COVID, where one person was very, very strict about safety and one person was very loose and it, be, it came down to, you are trying to kill me. You wow. are my partner and you are trying to kill me. Um, wow. And so the intensity of that was not something that any of us had ever worked with before. And when you say you are trying to kill me and that's the one partner in the couple, what do they mean there? What, what's, what's actually occurring inside that couple when they say something like that? Well, some of the examples that I've seen are couples where uh, one person is was either older or immune compromised in some way and wanting to be extremely strict around safety precautions and mm -hmm. not going out at all, you know, having groceries delivered, staying completely as isolated as possible. This is pre-vaccine. Yeah. And the other partner just feeling like, you know, I can, I can go out to the grocery store. I'll wear a mask. I can wash my hands. It'll be fine. Mm -hmm. And the partner who is wanting the safety and the strictness knows the other person tends to be a little on the sloppy side anyway, about rules and boundaries and things like that. And yeah. just didn't trust them that they wouldn't bring COVID back into the house and, you know, that they could, could result in a very, very horrendous death. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm similar in that I'm hearing this and seeing a little bit of this in terms of particularly around the safety thing, right? It's about a person's like security is sort of on the line. Yeah, I, and when you're talking, when you're talking life and death, yeah. it brings up the most protective defenses somebody has. Yeah. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's playing out now some with vaccines too, and how much people will travel and who they will go visit and completely. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I want to come back to the vaccine couple who maybe one person's pro vaccine, one, one's anti. And, but first I want to um, use this differentiation maybe as a lens we can look at it from. So I've heard you define, um, differentiation. I'm just going to read a definition that I've heard you say before, and maybe maybe this is the same definition you use right now. And you said, I define differentiation as the active ongoing process of a person being able to define their thoughts, their feelings, their wishes, and their desires to one another 
and to be able to tolerate the partner doing the same thing. Does that sound right? Or would you tweak that? No, that sounds, that sounds good. Definitely. Okay. And then what is the, and we'll unpack this a little more, but what is, what is individuation? Because I think these two get confusing for people, particularly psychologists, therapist types. It gets very confusing for people. Um, so first of all, let me talk about differentiation for another minute and then talk about individuation because differentiation takes the ability for somebody to, to go inside themselves and ask, what am I thinking? What am I feeling? What do I wish for in life? What are my desires? And to be able to express that congruently to the other person. Mm -hmm. Um, Congruently meaning honestly, um, because that's how they feel inside. Yeah. I mean, authentically, it would mean if, if I, if somebody's angry, they don't say I'm not angry. What makes you think I'm angry? Yeah. You know, and you know that that's not authentic at all. Yeah. Or they might say that they want something as a way of getting one up on a partner. And it doesn't really mean they really want it. Mm -hmm. It's more of how they're operating in a conflict situation or whatever. So I'm talking about the real honest, authentic expression of thoughts, feelings, wishes, and desires. Got it. So there's a, there's a, there's confusion in the field over a few things. And and one of them is that to me, true individuation has to do with the things that a person does separate from their relationship that has to do with how you're building a sense of self-esteem. So it could be, through career, it could be through a hobby, it could be through some passion, but it's, and people can be individuating all the time without even being in a relationship. Yeah. Um, But a lot of times therapists think of individuation as pseudo autonomy, like somebody is demanding some kind of independence Mm. from the other person. And they think that's individuation. Right. And it's it's not. It's you know, individuation is is real growth promoting um, development of self that you would do no matter who you were with, no matter you know. Um, it's, it's it's how people develop that sense of competency. Got it. And so differentiation is maybe someone could say it's a similar process, but it's happening in the context of relationship. Like, can I be myself in relationship to you? Well, it's, it's a relational process for one thing. Absolutely. Yeah. And it doesn't necessarily include behavior other than the expression of that internal self. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, cool. and, and the ability to hold still for your partner to do the same thing. Yeah. So, and, and that's where there's often a lot of tension, a lot of disruption in relationships because People take their partner's feelings and wishes very personally. They get reactive to it and don't know how to create that space where it's okay to have two separate people who have different thoughts, feelings, wishes, and desires. Yeah. And are unwilling to be uncomfortable in in that process of like navigating me being me and you being you and we're together. Yeah. Like they can't handle the discomfort or the sensations or the triggers or all the stuff that gets activated there. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So when we come to back to like developmental psychology and we talk about, um, I feel like I remembered in graduate school learning about, um, differentiation at at around two to three years old, and then also in adolescence, would you say that's differentiation or or, are people again, confusing that with individuation at those critical junctures where a young child is trying to actually be him or herself. Right. And then in adolescence also. So, I mean, I think one of the early people to talk about differentiation in childhood was Margaret Mahler, who we modeled some of the couple stages on. Mm. And, and she said that differentiation really starts at about five or six months, that the child is beginning, when, like when you see kids and they're putting their fingers in their parents' mouths. Um, or they're pulling hair. Mm-hmm. It, it's it's the beginning boundary to process of what's me and what's you. So it's yeah. the very very primitive early beginnings of uh, differentiation. 
that's starting way back then. And I think of differentiation as going on throughout life, really. Okay. Um, that we're all, if we are, and it, uh, something that I use often when I'm talking about it with clients is a disco ball. The disco ball has all those mirrors on it mm -hmm. and it's, it's, it's spinning. Yeah. And as we grow throughout life, we see, we learn different facets of ourselves and we expose different facets of ourselves to our partners. If you keep a relationship alive and growing and vital you're going to be exposing different parts of yourself at different times to a partner. Yeah. And they're going to be doing the same thing. Um, what, what I think often gets referred to in adolescence is the process of separation individuation, which is, you know, a child is really beginning to get ready to leave home. They're mm -hmm. testing their wings. They're, yeah. They start to do things that parents may not approve of. And then depending on how much the family can support somebody being who they are, the smoother that process is going to be. Yeah. And the more a parent digs in and demands the child be like them, the harder that process yeah. is going to be. <laughs> Brutal. <laughs> yeah, I'm a living testimony of that one. Um Okay. And if we, if we just come back to I'm trying to keep this really simple for the listener, yeah, I just, it's helpful for me to articulate it back to you. So differentiation is, is this ability in me to express what's going on inside congruently to someone I'm in a relationship with, say my wife, and for her to kind of hold that, that I'm different from her here. And she might not know what's going on in here and what she's feeling is different than what I'm feeling. And that's okay. And then vice versa. I'm making space for her to feel something totally different than me and even to believe uh, something different than me and see, see how the dynamic's going different than me. And I can tolerate that and I can hold that, right? Is that sort of what we're talking about with differentiation? Yeah. I mean, it gets more nuanced in different ways, but absolutely yes. And sometimes because partners have a hard time with that, it can it can spread out over a period of time to be holding that space. Yeah. I mean, a, a simple example is the very first time I wanted to go to Kenya uh, for the work that we're doing there, Pete really did not want to go. And it was an expensive donation. And I had never donated that much money because it was to build a classroom in one of these schools, it, actually the first school in this refugee area. And so we had, a, we had a significant conflict around it. And there's actually a video on our website that shows how we worked it out. But mm. um, it, it took many months to come to a place where he finally agreed to go with me, um, being clear that he still thought the money would be better donated here at home. Yeah. Than what I wanted to do, but he, but it, so anyway, so I mean, that's he allowed you to be you. It's kind of what you're saying over time. He was like, okay, this is really important to you and I love you and I'm going to still be with you and I'll even come. Right. Right. Got it. Right. Yeah. Right. And, and in the end he said um, that he got a lot from it that he didn't anticipate. Yeah. So, I mean, at the time that he first agreed, it was exactly what you said. He wasn't thinking that there would, that he would actually get something out of it, but he was doing it to support me. Yeah. Let's, what's the difference then between uh, happy wife, happy life. So he could have taken that sort of old adage and said, you know, I'm just going to go like, it's what she wants to do. And meanwhile, he's begrudgingly going along to get along because he doesn't want to rock the boat. He doesn't want to upset you and he doesn't want more conflict. That's probably re really common, right? But then he's going to resent you when he's there and you're going to be like not feeling his vibes and you guys are going to be disconnected. So what do you say to that type of couple? Who's we're not talking about that. That's not differentiation, right? No. In fact, I mean, that's conflict avoidance yeah. um, primarily and couples who come to therapy, there's a lot of conflict avoidance in couples who come in for therapy and you're right. That resentment builds and it, creates distance and doesn't solve anything. Um, I mean, there may, you know, 
if you go to a movie that your partner wants to see and you don't really want to see it and you just do it as happy wife, happy life, it's not that big of a deal. Yeah. Usually, and pe- both people do that at times for each other. Um, but on the big things, mm-hmm. if you do it repetitively, it tears away the fabric of the marriage. Yeah, totally. Sure does. Hey, folks, the world is kind of hurting out there relationally, don't you think? Um, if you want to get help uh, with the stress you're dealing with right now, and you want to learn how to get back to a good place with the people in your life, so that you can tackle all that you're facing, I recommend you come to a free class we're offering, okay? It's every Tuesday uh, for four weeks at 3 p.m. Mountain Time. 3 p.m. Mountain Time, 5 p.m. Eastern Time, 2 p.m. Pacific Time. And you can go to relationshipschool.com forward slash training to get the goods, all right? And the class is called Relationship Repair. We want to help you repair any mess-ups in your relational life And also, I think it's just going to be good for you to be in community and to be around other people. Um, There's still so much going on in the world. And I want you to come, okay? Relationshipschool.com forward slash training. And if you don't know how to get to zero, get back to a good place with the people you care most about, this class is for you because I'm going to show you exactly how to do that. All right, back to the show. Okay, let's, let's look at the vaccine, no vaccine couple from the lens of differentiation here. Um, and I've been seeing this one more myself and it's a pretty intense one. Um, you know, they've been married even 20 years and they didn't know they had such a significant difference. And it's like, wow. Uh, and let's say the couple, it's about the kids getting the vaccine or not. And the kids are teenagers, let's say. And one parent is saying, absolutely not. Uh, no way am I putting that in my body or our kid's body. And the other parents saying, nope, this is a safety issue. We've got to do this for the community, for our family, for school, so they can like have masks off at school or whatever. How how do you deal with a couple like that? And how does a couple actually, can a, can a couple even work through that? So let's, let's put the kids aside for a minute and just talk about the couple and then bring okay. the kids back in. All right. For the, for the couple who have that conflict, they rarely slow it down enough to find out more deeply what each other's position is. Mm -hmm. So it can become a very quick, reactive, nasty fight, but it's not slowed down to understand really why does it fit? Because you're talking about values usually when you're talking about the vaccine. Yeah. And so slowing it down to figure out what each other's values are and what's driving it is really important. And I'm not going to go into this, but Pete and I developed a process where we even have people do it in a way that they get to a position of true empathy for the other person's point of view, Mm -hmm. even if they don't agree with it. Yeah. And when that happens, then you can start creative problem solving before that there's not going to be any creative problem solving at all. Yeah. And I mean, I have one couple recently who have decided to live separately, but be very much in a relationship until the vaccine issue is resolved or until COVID is resolved. Yeah. And this is a decision that they've come to, to respect each other's position. Wow. Yeah. If that's what it takes. Right. And do you think issues like that, and another issue we could pick is I want to have children and you don't. Um, that's a, another common value difference that can be, you know, very difficult to It's very resolve. intense. It's very intense. Yeah. And I, I think I hear you saying that the basic instruction there, particularly for the couple's coach or therapist, is to help the couple have empathy for each other's position and deeply understand where they're coming from and what drives their values. Right. And... You know, I've been through the children issue with quite a few couples over the years and seen it get resolved in a number of different ways. So it's there's not always a one way that it's going to get resolved. But the couples who can really get what they're talking about. So, I mean, for example, with one couple, he already had two kids from a previous marriage. He felt like he spent 
he started having kids when he was 20. You know, he, his kids were getting grown up. He didn't want to start all over again. Yeah. She'd never had kids. I mean, that that's a pretty common yeah. picture, but in the end, <laughs> as they began to understand each other much better and he decided to have a child with her, she was very able to say, I can really get the sacrifice that you're making, that mm. you are really giving some things up that you thought you weren't going to have to give up. If yeah. you're going to be present, if you're going to be a real parent and you're going to be present. Right. And so as she began to be able to have that kind of empathy, instead of seeing him as selfish mm -hmm. and criticizing him and putting him down for being selfish. Yeah. Um, it created a very different feeling in that couple. Totally. Um, Huge. Okay. Let's come back to the couple, the vaccine, no vaccine and the kid issue when they're talking about their kids and they, they both feel like they have ownership of their kids. Right. So no, our kids need to be vaccinated. No, they don't. Yes, they do. Is that even, again, is that even salt? Let's say they do start to understand each other's position. Are you suggesting that maybe if that happens and there's empathy, true empathy on both sides, that one person, they'll, they'll eventually decide to go one way or the other? Well, hopefully so, because otherwise it will lead to a divorce in that situation. Yeah. Um, and luckily, I haven't had a couple with kids who've had the vaccine conflict, but I know they exist. Yeah. Um, but with every big, intense issue, and this is certainly a huge one, the tolerating of that tension while they really get deeply into why it matters so much and why they don't want to budge it creates, you know, and, and the therapist or the coach is able to say, I don't know how this is going to get resolved. I don't have, a, you know, I don't have, I don't know what it's going to look like, but I know that if each of you are committed to resolving it, and you get to a real understanding of each other's position, you yourself will be able to put forward ideas about how to solve it that take your partner into account. Mm -hmm. Take into a, you really truly take into account what matters. Yeah. Your partner. And if somebody's, for example, very narcissistic, they're going to have a really hard time doing that. Right. And it's going to expose where they have a lot of work to do. Um, yeah, completely. It seems like that's so hard in our world too, when we zoom out and look at the leadership in the world of the right versus wrong, us versus them. It, unless people are willing to actually listen, it just seems so intractable, right? It's unbelievable how yeah, adults I mean, it, just like, no, we're pushing my agenda and I don't care what you think. And no, I'm pushing my, you know, it's just like, really, is this how we do things? Yeah, I mean, one of one of the most intense couple sessions I ever had was the night before the election where Trump was elected. And I had a Democrat and a Republican <laughs> sitting in my office the <laughs> night before. Oh man. <laughs> and boy, was that were there fireworks in that one. And yeah. Uh, yeah. But I, I just love the principles we're talking about here, how we how we can navigate some of these so dis such difficult value differences. Um, and, let's, and can I just say yeah, one more thing, which please. is it pushes the growth of the coach or the therapist to be able to be in the room with people with those kinds of conflicts or to be yeah. on Zoom, whatever. But because we can want to solve it to get out of the tension, too. Oh, yeah. The tension's hard to be with, right? Very hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, let's bring in attachment patterns. I, I'm curious what you think about um, how much do you think a, like the deep nervous system kind of wiring around what I define as just a seek avoid kind of pattern? One person's a seeker, more anxious, and one person's more of an avoider or withdrawer. Um, and there's, there's so many layers, right? To, to couples working with couples that, okay, we repaired this little fight, let's say on the surface. And I kind of got your world. We understood each other, but, but then there was this other issue about how, we both reacted to it, which is more, sometimes more of a deeper attachment pattern that's older that maybe they have aren't aware of or aren't addressing adequately where one person withdraws and the other person wants to talk all the time about it. How do you, um, I, I guess, how do you work with that? Um, 
Well, so, I mean, I would say a few things about that, but, but, you know, in the model that Pete and I used or developed, we talk about couples as going through a series of stages. And so when couple, like, I think each of us has an attachment pattern that we developed usually with each parent, if we're raised in a two parent family. Mm -hmm. So your, your attachment pattern can be different with mother and father or two mothers or two fathers, but I mean, it can, it can be different. And so, I mean, for example, I had a very secure attachment with my dad and uh, a very avoidant attachment with my mother. And so when things are going well, I can operate completely out of that secure place. And when I would get really stressed, um, my old pattern used to be withdraw, do it myself, become very avoidant. And so part of it is the couple beginning to understand what each person's attachment style is or pattern is, understand how it gets activated. And when you develop a stronger sense of a, a stronger capacity for differentiation, some of that anxious insecurity goes away mm-hmm. also. I mean, it doesn't mean it won't ever be triggered. Yeah. But the more, the more solid a person's differentiation is, the more they can handle the difference in those mm. attachment patterns. And again, not personalize it. So, yeah. um, you know, I have a couple right now with a lot of trauma and, um, she's, she's very anxious, insecure. She understands like the still face experiment where, Mm -hmm. um, if she gets a still face from him, it just activates enormous anxiety and she'll, so anyway, it took a bunch of work to help them handle timeouts Mm -hmm. for timeouts to become constructive and for her to to feel it in her biology that a timeout is not the same as the still face or disappearing. Right. Mm-hmm. And that comes from a stronger integration of self that you can yeah. handle. Okay, my partner's different. In this case, if he calms down, if he acknowledges when he's getting super activated, if he calms down, he's not going to be... Um, vicious with me, you know, he won't be, right. he'll be, um, we'll, we'll be able to interact in a better way. Yeah. I want to return to something you said, I feel like it's very important there that if we're more differentiated or as we work on our differentiation, being able to tolerate the other person's kind of emotions and way of being in relationship, um, we can, uh, increase our capacity to deal with some of those attachment pattern feelings, triggers that come up, right? And so it's maybe not such a big deal. But you also said, even though it might continue for a long time, and I, I'm just curious, because you're more senior than me in terms of this ex- life and experience with couples, is it possible to change the nervous system in a way that is uh, doesn't get activated relationally like this? Or is it so deep and so entrenched because of 18 years or whatever of being with our parents or caregivers that it's just, it's just one of those things that it's like, stop trying to get rid of your fear of abandonment, for example, or your anxiety. Like it's always going to be there and it's how you work with it. What's your take on that? I think it's sort of both, um, really that your that deep wiring is there. Yeah. Um, and so it is, it is going to be activated at times. The intensity with which it's going to be activated is going to reduce a lot. Mm-hmm. And your capacity to manage it both individually and interpersonally gets so much better yeah. that it's not the kind of factor that it was in earlier years. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. Cool. Um, Yeah. It's so interesting. And then, and I loved also what you said about the two parent system. If you grew up with two parents, there might be two different, um, wiring in my nervous system, right? One with dad, like I had a more avoidant dad and a more kind of anxious, ambivalent mom. So I've got both in me, right. Which is really interesting under stress and over time, uh, for me. And then my perception, I thought another thing I learned from Pete, which was cool was, um, 
the the projections that start to happen. And, you know, you guys, I think, use that term playing my movie. Um, that's sort of what I do. If Ellen, my wife, has more of a flat face or tired look on her face, I can, my nervous system sometimes feels that as threatening, right? Mm-hmm. So I start playing a movie that she's upset with me. I start making up a big story about it. And that that might be a place where I'm less differentiated. Would you say that's true? Yeah, I would say her, the, the look on her face is activating some anxiety in you. Yeah, an old memory, yep. Okay, and then what you say to yourself in a moment like that, like, do you say to yourself, I'm anxious, I better go check it out. Something like that, yeah, or she's pissed at me, or what just happened, like, why is she, you know, what's going on with our connections different, what happened here? But like in a well-differentiated couple, somebody in your shoes would, would go to her and say, you know, I'm starting to feel anxious. It looks like something's not okay. Are you okay? Yeah. And then she's authentic either. Yes, I'm totally okay. And I don't know what you're picking up, but I'm totally okay. Yeah. Or no, I'm not. You picked it up really well. In fact, I, there is something that I've been getting ready to talk about, or there is something that is going on in me. Yeah. An important part of differentiation is the act of initiation, like taking that moment yeah. of anxiety and actually moving forward and doing something about it. I was sitting with a couple yesterday where both of them said, I'm too passive to initiate. <laughs> they each said it, that it was okay, their language. Luck. It wasn't my language. Even. Right. Um, and I said, well, you know, if, if you're each going to stay too passive to initiate, you are going to keep having these periods where you feel disconnected. You know, they were, they came in because they don't want to feel disconnected, but neither one of them wants to take the risk of doing the first (laughs) initiation. I'm too passive. Interesting narrative there. (laughs) Good luck with your connection then. Yeah. Wow. Um, How do you, uh, as we wind down here, if there's, you know, I know it's complex and there's many things, but um, just a couple of tips for, allowing for differentiation, allowing for individual growth while maintaining a strong connection. What is, uh, what are some of the kind of central uh, point or two that a, a listener can focus on? Well, maybe I could tell a quick story because I yeah. use this, this story a lot with couples okay. um, as a starting place for realizing that you can handle more than you think. And I think that's an Mm -hmm. important thing. Like people Mm -hmm. are afraid of the differences because they think that it's good. They escalate so quick in their minds about what it's going to mean. Yeah. So I tell the story of a couple in a workshop with us who had been learning about differentiation, had been practicing some of the skills and, and they had had 10 years of that intense conflict avoidance hostility. I mean, they both walked around and anyway, at one point, Um, she said to him, uh, do you really, really want to know how I feel? And this is in front of a group of other couples. And he said, yeah, I do. And she said, I pray for your death. Wow. And the whole room just, I mean, you could feel the tension in that room. Yeah. And that guy, bless his heart. I have no (laughs) idea how he did this, but he sat there for maybe two minutes quiet and you could see, I mean, you could watch his brain was actually, you could tell he was like going, figuring out what am I going to say? And finally he said to her, so just how long have you been praying? Which was an amazing question to ask her. And it said, that question communicated, I can hear what you have to say. Mm -hmm. And she proceeded to say she'd been praying for 10 years because she was a Catholic and she didn't believe in divorce and she didn't know how to resolve these horrendous conflicts. And so she just, that's, that was her way of coping. Um, And they were able to have a conversation that they never thought they would be able to have. It was very powerful. Mm. And the next day they were walking along the road and a big semi truck was coming toward them. And he turned to her and he said to her, now's your chance. (laughs) And she came back to the workshop and she said, in that moment, I felt like the trajectory of our marriage turned upside down. I really got it 
that he could handle me being me, that I could start coming forward and saying things. So the, the, the first thing to answer your question is a commitment to take risks with each other mm -hmm. and to see that as growth trying to happen, not as pathology, not as something bad. Yeah. And that makes such a difference when people understand that that's a way to keep their relationships vital. Yeah. People get very locked up here. And it's almost like I hear you saying it's, it's okay to even air some judgments once in a while, because at least it's getting everything out on the table. And, you know, and ideally messy, you do it in a way that takes ownership. Yeah. Of it. Like yeah. I get judgmental or I, you know, I see you this way sometimes or whatever. It's, you yeah. know, I don't let couples unload on each other. Sure. Yes. Um, uh, one more question on the, uh, well, a couple more as we wind down here. What do you say to people? Um, the uh, very common refrain these days appears to be, how do I, how do I have a good relationship with my, and my, how do I have a good relationship period? My partner is narcissistic. And I'm uh, like, wait a second, hold on a second. Like we, <laughs> no. let's first of all, what is narcissism that gets very thrown around a lot these days? Can a person have a relationship with someone with narcissist, like true narcissistic personality disorder, depending on the type? And can that person actually make progress? Well, first of all, I mean, I look at a big continuum from self-absorption all the way up to a real sociopath. Okay. You know, mm -hmm. and so a true sociopath, you're not going to have a relationship with that's mutually interdependent. It's yeah. not, it's not going to happen. Yeah. Um, but there are lots of people with narcissistic issues, narcissistic, even low end personality disorder who are very changeable in the right circumstances, given mm -hmm. the right support, given the right therapy. Yeah. Um, you know, our culture support, we live in a culture of narcissism, first of yeah. all. Yeah. And it supports that. And um, unfortunately, very often, individual therapists can destabilize marriages inadvertently because they can collude with the person who sees the other one uh, as, as, a, yeah. as a narcissist yeah, um, and doesn't know how to help them actually work with their partner or get their partner into good couples therapy. And so, I mean, I actually like working with some of these intricate situations in couples where one person is more narcissistic. Yeah. Um, but it's a big commitment when you take on a couple like that and you seriously take it on to, to be willing to go all the way through to help them change that. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Cool. Um, all right. As we wind down here, Ellen, uh, this has been awesome. Thanks so much for your, your wisdom and your experience here. It's, it's huge. Uh, one of the questions I always ask my guests, I might've asked you a couple of years ago when we had an interview there at UCLA is uh, if I had a room full of a thousand teenagers and I could only share with them one thing about love and relationships and you were whispering in my ear, what would you want me to tell that group of kids? Oh, wow. That's a great question. Um, I'd probably say something like um, real love is worth it, but you're going to go through hell on the way to getting there. <laughs> Nice. That could be a title of a new book that you write. <laughs> <laughs> it could be actually. <laughs> cool. Ellen Bader, where can people find you and uh, Pete and the work you're up to in the world? Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, uh, www.couplesinstitute.com is our website. And for information about the training, it's couplesinstitute.com forward slash developmental model. Awesome. Um, so for the, any therapist listening or coach listening, um, please check out our training and for couples, just go to couplesinstitute.com. Okay. Wonderful. Great. And we'll link the uh, past episode that we did a couple years back as well in the show notes. Um, Ellen, thanks so much. Hey, thank you, Jason. It's always fun to talk to you. So uh, thanks a lot. Yeah. Likewise. Hey, hey, uh, outro. What's up people? action step <laughs> outro <laughs> this is officially the outro
in case you're wondering. Okay, go check out the couplesinstitute.com. Uh, these guys do exceptional trainings, would be my guess. I've never done one. But that'd be a guess just because Ellen and Pete are so awesome and they know so much and they are elders in the space. Uh, lots and lots of experience. Other than that, please chew on this whole thing called differentiation. What does this really mean for you? Can you tolerate your partner's emotional expression and their truth without getting hooked into it? And can you hold space and be the bigger person that has the capacity to be with whatever they're expressing and stay curious, stay interested and like, you know, okay, wow. Thanks for sharing that. And I loved Ellen's story there of the couple at the end. Uh, that's, uh, I think a very useful example for us to get our differentiation muscles on. And can you have a conversation with your partner about this or an ex, or even just a friend who's listening to this podcast? And can you nerd out for a minute on differentiation? We go a little deeper into differentiation in our relational mastery course, the deep psychology of intimate relationships, in case you're interested, uh, that, um, that was a fun class to teach. So there's probably lots more to learn here and you can certainly come to one of our events. Um, make sure you take the conflict quiz. That's a good primer to see what kind of conflict style you have. That's relationshipschool.com forward slash quiz. Our accepted and connected event is coming up December, I believe, 2nd, 3rd, and 4th. So you're going to want to check that out. And that's on our main website, relationshipschool.com. All right, y'all. Thanks so much. Talk soon. If you're in pain relationally and you need immediate support, uh, our coaches can help you. I've trained uh, almost 100 coaches at this point, relationship coaches that are amazing humans, and they have the chops to help you. Uh, get through this hard time, this hard moment you're going through. Uh, or if you want to actually hire a coach and have someone in your corner to continue to um, up-level your communication skills, your listening skills, your conflict skills, these folks are incredible, okay? So go. all you need to do is go to relationshipschool.com forward slash MRC. That stands for My Relationship Coach. So relationshipschool.com forward slash MRC, right? If you want immediate direct, effective help. Check them out. Hey, thanks so much for listening. Please subscribe to this YouTube channel. Share one of these videos with a friend. We want to help the planet get their act together around relationships. And you are one of them. So thank you. Thank you.